Part 1, A Brief History of Quarantine Disease and quarantine have always been maritime problems. In the 16th and 17th century, Mediterranean ships were required to anchor for a period of time, often 18 days, before goods were allowed to be offloaded. And you can see that in this image here, where the ships are actually um, anchored quite distant from the town. If sickness was detected aboard vessels, goods would not be offloaded and crews were sent to island lazarettos or, I or isolation hospitals where they were quarantined until they recovered or died. It was not uncommon for infected ships to be turned away from ports of call. In the 16th century Mediterranean, quarantine was intended to strike a balance between health and trade, but with this was not the case everywhere. After Columbus arrived in the so-called New World, and as ships began traveling more regularly across the Atlantic Ocean, carrying European settlers and then captive Africans, quarantine became a growing concern. Conditions aboard slave ships and later indenture ships that were carrying Chinese and South Asian indentured laborers were horrific. Captive Africans who were kidnapped from West Africa and transported across the Atlantic to the Americas were chained and confined in the hold of the ship. Sickness and death were widespread. And this here is the diagram of, a, of the slave ship Brooks that was created by Quakers of Portsmouth in 1787 and used widely in the British campaign to abolish the slave trade. Upon arriving in the Caribbean and the southern U.S., enslaved people were confined on ships and or in quarantine stations until they were believed to be healthy or until they passed away. As captive Africans were believed to be goods and not people, we can see how quarantine concerns in the Mediterranean Sea that centered on trade and goods and commodities were then extended from Europe to the Americas through the transport of enslaved people. As large-scale migration began in the 19th century across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, quarantine became more commonly associated with the movements of people. Health restrictions on movement informed immigration laws and became a critical tool in racial border control practices. So in the United States, Angel Island and Ellis Island served as the first stops for ships crossing the Atlantic and the Pacific, respectively. Passengers were scrutinized and often detained, especially if they were Asian, so if they were Chinese, Japanese, and South Asian, because these are the groups of people historically who are most often associated with disease. And we can see through this example how contemporary anti-Asian racism is really deeply rooted in history. So quarantine was a practice commonly used in 19th century Canada and continues to exist today. In what is now British Columbia, Chinese men believed to have leprosy were sent to Darcy Island uh, off the coast of Victoria, where they were left to die. From 1891 to 1924, one year after the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed, the island was operative as a leprosy colony. The BC government sent supplies to the island monthly, and you can see those supplies here in the slide, but the men were required to take care of themselves, including burying those who perished. And keep in mind that leprosy was a disease that uh, severely disabled and disfigured its victims. In 1924, the remaining men were sent to nearby ben Bentink Island, which didn't close until 1956 when the last man died. Today, Darcy Island is part of the Gulf Islands uh, National Park Reserves where you can go for a picnic or you can camp. And there is a small uh, plaque in remembrance of the men who died there. Quarantine provisions continue to exist today, both in shipping and in immigration regulations. As Alison Bashford argues, Quarantine was a key mechanism through which the authority and territoriality of modern states, nation states was asserted and became meaningful. So the point that she's making is that quarantine has always been about protecting the borders of the nation state. And we see that historically, we also see it in the present day uh, around concerns about COVID and the need to close the border between Canada and the US or the need to cancel international flights into 
the can into Canada, into China, into the United States. So there is a very deep connection between quarantine and uh, the production of the nation state. All Immigration Acts, from Canada's first Immigration Act to the current Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, contain provisions to deal with illness and disease. So in the Immigration Act of 1869, we see at the, um, the fourth to the last line that quarantine stations will be maintained at Halifax, St. John, New Brunswick, Gross Isle, and, and then there's regulations or, or um, specifications for immigration agents. And in today's, um, the current Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, there is a considerable amount of attention devoted to health and contagious disease. Today, those seeking entry to Canada undergo medical examinations in their country of origin even before they arrive on Canadian soil. What's interesting about COVID and the cruise ship is that it has really complicated or even undermined our understandings of the relationship between nations and disease. And it's also demonstrated the ways in which the boundaries of the nation state have become hardened through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So as I said earlier, um, borders have been closed, travel has been restricted, um, even though countries are really adamant that they don't want to restrict the movement of goods, they do want to restrict the movements of people. So I want to move to talk a little bit now about maritime law. What is maritime law? So oceans are often described as lawless spaces. In his book, his recent award-winning book, actually, The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier, Ian Urbina reinforces this myth by portraying oceans as sites of piracy, smuggling, human traffic, trafficking, and environmental degradation. While oceans are certainly all of those things, they're also spaces of law. In the early 17th century, in 1609 to be precise, Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius, who is often identified as the father of international law, reached the conclusion that the sea was free. His argument was not that the sea was free of law, but that the sea was free for European trade. Grotius claimed that European powers such as the Portuguese and Dutch made legal claims through the voyages of their ships. In the following century, Europeans entered trade agreements, including treaties regarding the transatlantic slave trade. Ships, trade agreements, and treaties are just some of the laws that order the seas. Laws at the sea also include the flags that fly on ships, and these are some of the flags on, on this slide here. The identity of ships, including their names and nationalities, were often expressed through flags. The flag of the ship determined which laws applied to passengers and crews aboard. If someone committed murder on a ship, for example, they would be tried in the country of the ship's flag. A very famous case that illustrates these jurisdictional uh, questions is called Dudley versus Stevens. Uh, and this case was decided in 1884. Tom Dudley, Edwin Stevens, the captain, Edmund Brooks, and Richard Parker, the cabin boy, were all sailing on a yacht called the Mignonette near the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. The vessel was caught in the storm, and the men managed to launch the lifeboat. On July 5th, the Mignonette sank. The men had some turnips, and they also found a sea turtle, which they ate. But by July 13th, they had no source of liquid and began drinking their own urine out of necessity and out of desperation. As you can imagine, they felt very ill. They drew lots on who they should sacrifice so that the others could stay alive. Dudley and Stevens both had families. Parker, by contrast, was deemed to be an inexperienced cabin boy and an orphan. With no prospect of rest you, they decided that the best thing to do would be to eat him, to sacrifice him to save the rest. The case was heard in the High Court of Justice, and the men were initially found guilty. The court ruled that there was no defense of necessity in the charge of murder. However, the court did recognize that the sea was an exceptional space. Given the circumstances of the murder, and also the fact that they were at sea, 
Dudley and Stevens were eventually released. Flags of convenience do not only determine um, the laws that are applicable on particular ships, but they also have a great deal to do with labor. So the term flag of convenience was officially invented in the 1940s by American shippers who wanted to register their vessels in poor countries. For example, many European and American owned vessels fly flags of Panama so they don't have to pay taxes, so they can avoid labor regulations, and they can exploit their crews and pay them very little, and they can also avoid environmental regulations. Alan Sekula describes flags of convenience as the beginning of globalization, where maritime labor was outsourced and where ships became floating factories. But flags of convenience were much, came much earlier. In the 19th century, after the, formal, after the U.S. and Britain formally abolished slavery in 1808, not slavery, sorry, the slave trade in 1808, U.S. ships often flew U.S. flags. According to historian William Walter Johnson, Old Glory became the flag of convenience for slave traders worldwide, as more and more nations allowed the British the right to search their ships at sea, or at the very least signed joint cruising agreements, more and more slaves were shipped under the cover of the United States' sovereignty. Whatever their port of origin or their destination, slavers kept an American flag aboard, running it up against the mast whenever they encountered a British cruiser at sea. So we see here how Old Glory as a flag of convenience allowed uh, the illegal slave trade to continue. When people take cruises, they don't often think about flags of convenience. However, the COVID pandemic has placed this front and center. When countries were denying entry to cruise ships, many authorities argued that these ships, their passengers and crew, needed to seek aid not from these specific countries, but from the countries that the ships were affiliated with. As most of these ships were flying, flying flags of convenience, of Panama, for example, these countries didn't have the resources to take care of wealthy passengers from Europe and North America that are vacationing on luxury cruise lines. So just to uh, reiterate, these countries that these cruise ships were arriving in were saying, no, you have to actually, uh, the responsibility for the ship, the passengers and the crew lies in the country whose flag um, these ships are flying. But many of these countries are poor countries in the Caribbean and can't afford to take care of European and North American passengers. Flags of convenience have also had serious implications on COVID bailouts. Poland and Denmark have refused to bail out cruise ship companies with flags of convenience, as has the United States. Companies wanting bailout funds uh, Pol Poland and Denmark ruled, must pay domestic taxes. In the United States, States Norwegian Cruise Lines has been excluded from the $2.3 trillion stimulus plan and has been seeking other ways to recover its losses. Several passengers have filed lawsuits against Princess Cruise Lines for failing to protect them from COVID-19. But in many ways, these cruise lines are protected from maritime laws including the Limitation of Liability Act and Death on the High Seas Act, which was passed in 1920. So we see the ways in which these jurisdictional complications or um, these jurisdictional tensions allow cruise ship companies to get off from uh, being responsible and from being accountable to the passengers that they have effectively let down. It's interesting that cruise ships haven't been the source of news stories or of media attention, but today, given the COVID pandemic, they've become quite central. And we see the ways in which uh, cruise ships have also become a metaphor for contagion and the need for quarantine. So some universities describe dormitories as being the equivalent of cruise ships, where contagion and infection would, and virus would spread, spread rapidly.